In this video, I look at using a combination of ESPR and radiance to identify glare sources and undertake a Guth visual comfort probability assessment. Visual comfort is a recurring concern in the design process. In this video, we consider what constitutes a model that's fit for that purpose and then make minor adjustments on an existing ESP model. We'll then follow a sequence of visual assessments with a couple of tangents discussing what's going on in the background. In previous videos, we covered daylight factors. They are relatively quick to calculate in radiance, even when you have larger grids. For example, these are the daylight factors in that open office plan that you saw in the title sequence. There are any number of ways of displaying such information. The point is that such metrics only tell us part of the story. Would someone sitting at this desk on a spring morning with the sunlight painting complex patterns on the wall and work surfaces find it uncomfortable? Many practitioners use radiance to answer such questions. On the left, are glare sources for a person just entering the office on a spring afternoon. On the right, there are glare sources from someone seating in the room on a spring morning. Of course, sometimes glare is not even in the field of view. What we can see from these images is that visual comfort assessments are specific to the occupant's head position, the current weather, the time of day, and the season. And unlike the single daylight factor assessments in the past, visual comfort implies multiple views. Facade details, furniture, and fittings, they all play a part in visual comfort. If the visual context is to be extracted from a thermal model, it probably needs to be a bit, have a bit more geometric detail than is strictly necessary for solar and thermal assessments. We'll start with a small office model. It already includes furniture and fittings. I've used it for many different assessment types. So looking at that model, well, we've got a pretty good idea where the eyes in the room are likely to be. And yep, there's some visual clutter. The elephant in the room, though, is the abstraction in that facade. It's a geometrically flat in the wireframe view. If I switch over to a blender view, it gives us some more clues. And the bad news is that, well, this thermal model is essentially of a flat, mid-1980s, cheap and cheerful facade. And it's not a particularly good fit with the increasing prevalence of deep facades with rain screens in commercial buildings. Indeed, some of those facades are gratuitously thick. There's a strong argument to update this facade. Our habitual 1D focus on layer thickness, again, tells us only part of the story. In an earlier video, I mused about the forgotten heat flow paths and explored how simple things, like including window reveals, impacts the area of exposed surfaces in facades, and thus the energy needed to condition them. And here, in a visual context, with a thicker facade, we've got reveals and offset that virtual eyes might be sensitive to. With that in mind, I tweaked the model and added a 100 millimeters internal reveal to the framing above the spandrel, and I then revised the composition to add, for example, an internal surface void, and as well as a rain screen. And that took the overall thickness from around 120 millimeters to a bit over 300 millimeters. Again, if we go back and view this in Blender, here are the inside and outside views of that revised facade. It's a little bit more interesting context to explore visual comfort. If you're curious as to how these 3D views were created from the thermal model, you might want to pause and look back over my previous videos of how ESPR generates wavefront files that can be used in Blender. Oh, and they can also be used in Radiance. 
And before I actually start the visual comfort assessments, here's a brief tangent. There is an option when creating those wavefront files in ESPR to explicitly express each material layer in each construction of the thermal model as 3D entities. This is really great for model QA, but that facility was missing from radiance models. The increasing thickness and complexity of facades is a strong argument to shift to those 3D bodies that we see in the blender and, and use that as the basis for radiance models. In preparation for this video, I took time to closely observe the workflows involved in visual assessments. As we all know, radiance is notorious in requiring an arcane set of knowledge about command line arguments and details of file contents. It's a serious learning curve that the ESBR E2R module, well, it was designed to mitigate a lot of that. And yet, for what I wanted to show in this video, there were still times when I was manually editing files or issuing commands to the operating system. These were instances of friction and distracted me from the task at hand. My goal was for users not to be distracted. And a score of software iterations later, I think we're getting rather close to that goal. The module now retains a lot more information about the user's intent and the choices they make and leverages that information, does a rather better job of managing radiance files for workflows that involve multiple assessments. It better supports what-if questions. It's got a please make me a variant of this scene facility. And if I've created my own Radiance model, it can import the Radiance Rift file and build a new scene from them. If you think you know the ETR module of ESPR, the journey you're about to see should be a pleasant surprise. Before starting the session, let's touch on a few user choice points. Each scene has a purpose. And that sets the appropriate defaults and guides the subsequent interactions in the interface. For example, if you select glare as the scene topic, it ensures that any subsequent views that you create conform to the standard 180 degree view type and has at least two bounces. On the right is an external image scene type and it has a high light level variability set. Many of these purposes involve selecting a focus zone. For example, a daylight factor assessment will involve a grid of points which need to be defined from the geometric information related to that zone. And thankfully, the ref file now remembers how that grid was defined. Scenes, well, they can have multiple named views. And there are several options for their creation. A useful strategy, if you want to use the same viewpoint for several different named scenes, is to do a quick interactive radiant session and use the view file name dot view command. It's helpful to keep track of background chatter as E2R invokes various radiance modules. Enough with the preliminaries. Let's start those visual assessments. As always, invocation starts in the project manager. We're going to go to visualization, ask for color rendered, and this will start up the E2R module. We then have our choice of geometric sources. I'm going to pick both of them for maximum flexibility, and then I would like to do a glare assessment. I'll set a focus zone for that assessment to the office on the left, and I can confirm a root name and some documentation for the models that are going to be created. I want to do my glare on, say, a spring afternoon. The sun will be slightly low coming in. It might be rather interesting. 
set a couple of minor things and then say yes I'll actually supply you with the name of the wavefront object file uh, to convert into a radiance mesh And I'll just double quickly check the name of that object file and type it in. It's asking about the ground plane that it's going to add in to both of those radiance models that it's creating. I'll set it a little bit below the floor level to keep it out of the way. When I created the wavefront file, I excluded glass surfaces from it. I've just told this there. And yes, please go and convert that for me. So, um, the description complete. I need to set up some viewpoints. I've got two scenes here. I want to have the one with the underscore W, which is the wavefront variant of the thing. And now I'll go into the scene viewpoints. And again, I'm going to have a look back to see what the name of the scenes were, the view files are in there. So this will pick up on a previous glare study that I did. We'll then scan that in. I give it a name. And It'll display. Oh, that wasn't quite the one I want. I want to shift this over into that manager A room. So I just need to change the X value, something like 1.5 or maybe 1.4. And there's my viewpoint, good enough for government work. Save the view information. And I've now just double checked the scene parameter options. Again, these would have been set when I nominated the scene purpose. So save that. It's given it a name related to that it's an object file origin and it's related to Claire. And now I can ask to render the scene. I'll use that viewpoint that I created earlier. There could be many, many different viewpoints and I could run many glare assessments from those. In the background, it will start processing the image, uh, the rendering for that. So we'll speed that bit up just a little bit. Now, once it's generated the background image, and it will start running this fine glare application. So this bit in is, is in real time. It's searching through the uh, image of the rendering of the space and finding the glare sources. And we're now starting to see some sources of glare that are being identified. Okay, so here's the background image in the 180 degree view that is common for this for glare assessments. And it'll do a little bit of processing to decide well and where to draw those. So those are the glare sources. So in the afternoon, they're well away from the desk. But what about the morning? We'll see that in a moment. It's also done this Gluth uh, BCP calculation. So there's the values for those, which will come in handy later on. Now we can see that there are sets of files related to the ESP version of the Radiance files. And there's a separate set for the object-based glare assessment. So these are kept well apart. They're independent. You can flip back and forth between them as required.
So if we go back to the current scene, so we've got two scenes here, one the ESP and one the wavefront, and we want to make a variant of this glare scene that we were just working on. So I answer a couple of questions, and now I'm going to give a, a few characters to change the, uh, so when it copies files, they're uniformly named. And my intent here is that if we see here, now we've got a new set of files that have been created. I go back here and I go to sky type. That was an afternoon assessment. I would like to have a morning assessment at the same time of year to see what the impact of that is. So instead of 15 hours 30, I'll do it at 9.30 in the morning. And I'll save that sky description. And now I can go and just check that this viewpoint is still set. Again, this is an, a new model, a variant. Yep, it has that information in it. That's good. I'll just exit that facility and ask to render that scene using the viewpoint I set up earlier. And again, I'll check, see what's going on in the background. Speed that process up. So having done the background image, it's now scanning through that and determining where the glare sources are in that. Here's that background image. Sun's now all over the working surfaces and the monitor. And here we see glare sources, yes, all around that wall and some on the work area. And when I continue, I get the Guth VCP values for this as well. Now, of course, I can now go back into the scene. I see I've got yet another one in there, and I have the potential to add additional scenes as required. Okay, another day, another design meeting. Oh, they'd like to see some outside views. Okay, so let's go back in. You can see we've got more scenes that we've created for them and add another scene. We'll go ahead and generate both for flexibility. This time I'm going to, the scene purpose is external image. I've got some root name and some documentation I can fill in. I'm in a hurry, so I'll just accept the default values for that. And what would be a good one for the summer? No, actually, better. Winter. Yes, we're going to do a winter view. The sun will be coming in rather nicely there. I'm going to give it the wavefront object file name. Same one I used earlier. I'll build this new scene off of that. I'll reset the ground plane like I did before. Yes, go ahead and transform the wavefront object file. And off it goes. Yep, that worked out fine. It made an awk tree. Okay, I need a viewpoint. I had one earlier. Let's just go ahead and pull that one in. Okay, southwest.view. That'll do. Type in the name. 
import that give it a local name for picking save that view information parameter options quick view of the thing with just one reflection uh, and small file that'll be all right save the riff file okay it's got new oops there's a phone call coming in I'll go and deal with that okay let's Phone call done with, let's open the thing back up and go back into the project. Yes, it's still there, the one that I created. Viewpoints, yep, that one's still there, good. So let's render the scene using that viewpoint. Just do this interactively, put it to the screen. Drag it down a bit smaller so I can see it. Give and set the shutter on it so I can see it a little bit better. It's a bit bright at the moment. That's a little bit better view. Okay, and those of you who know Radiance knows that you can go in and you can uh, zoom in slightly on an interactive basis. Let's look at this corner here and maybe do that another time. Yes, okay, let's get a little bit closer here. Okay, so there's our detail. I can capture that image and get it off to the design team for consideration. Now, I'll also save this as a close underscore SW view that way I can pull this view in to other scenes if I want it. Okay, done with that. And off we go. Back to Visual Comfort. In my folder, I've got a number of files called .vcp, which E2R saves off the goof vcp values in there. And I've got, of course, a little Python script that will scan that in and use a graphic plotting library to produce the graphic for that. Several times I've mentioned that there's a bridge file that holds meta information between ESPR and Radiance. And so there's a little look at that file. It's again holding information on the different scenes, the kinds of choices that the user has made, some of the specifics um, like gridding files and focus zones and that sort of thing. And um, that's one of the things that's been expanded to make this whole process rather more straightforward. Another thing worth noting is the similarities and differences in the Radiance Rift files when we have two variants of a similar scene. A lot of the entities inside are the same, only a few differ. One of the things to be aware of when we're moving to full 3D bodies is that there may be a minor mismatch between the spacing of the thermal zones in the ESPR model and our declared thickness of the materials that it's made out of for the titians. Usually it doesn't matter on the thermal side, but it can show up as a little irritating glitch in the visual view. One reason to how to look at ETR is that it provides very useful information for an integrated view of performance that includes not only thermal but visual assessments for design teams to work with. 